welcome. Welcome to worship this fourth Sunday of Advent as we move closer and closer to Christmas and we fill the candles on our Advent wreath. I welcome you to this time together. This is the Sunday of joy and we will light the fourth candle on our wreath in just a moment um, as we celebrate and remember the week of joy together uh, on Advent. So just a couple announcements as we as we come together, uh, no matter where you are or when it is. So let's see, later this evening, uh, depending on the weather, so make sure you check your email before you hop in your car or make your way downtown. But the plan is to have a time of greeting, of Christmas cheer, of glad tidings later this afternoon. Details uh, are in the emails that went out. And then a longest night of the year service for this is this is the solstice um, this this day. And so so that is uh, our plan for tonight. Um, again, weather dependent. So check your email. If the weather is inclement, we will cancel and I'll send out an email. And then, of course, Christmas Eve is coming quickly uh, this week. So on Christmas Eve in the morning from 10 to noon, I again will be at the church uh, with some glad tidings bags. So do remember to wear a mask, to be prepared to follow uh, social distancing guidelines and, and all of those good things. Um, if you're coming uh, to greet me at the church and pick up a bag of of glad tidings, I'll, I'd be happy to see you and to share some Christmas cheer together. Um, I think those are my announcements, those those two simple things um, as we gather in this space. Okay, let us be in a spirit of worship as we begin with our prelude. we catch of your gift of the depths of joy, even in the midst of fear, of challenge, of struggle, even when we are not sure of your presence. Ignite the flame of joy within us, that we might glow with its brilliance from the inside out.
Help us face the silence of unknowing and embrace it as the pregnant pause before joyful new beginnings. Amen. You are invited to light four candles on your Advent wreath at home. One for hope, peace, love, and joy. Our reading from the prophet Isaiah today comes from chapter 7 and it's verses 1 to 14. Some of the verses of this passage I think will be familiar to you and others will feel a little more distant. They might not trigger such a memory um, and you might wonder if you've ever heard them uh, in the prophet Isaiah. I encourage you and prod you to go back to your Bible and to find them if they are new to you. From the prophet Isaiah chapter 7 verses 1 to 14. In the days of Ahaz, Yotham's son and grandson of Judah, King Judah's king Uzziah, Aram's king Rezen, and Israel's king Pekah, Ramalia's son, came up to attack Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. When the house of David was told that Aram had become allies with Ephraim, their hearts and the hearts of their people shook as the trees of a forest shake when there is a wind. But the Lord said to Isaiah, go out to meet Ahaz, you and your son Sherazab, at the end of the channel by the upper pool, by the road to the field where laundry is washed, and say to him, be careful, stay calm, do not fear, and do not lose heart over these two pieces of smoking torches over the burning anger of Rezin, Aram, and Ramalia's son. Aram has planned evil against you with Ephraim and Ramalia's son saying, let's march up against Judah and tear it apart and capture it for ourselves and install Tabil's son as its king. But the Lord God says, it will not happen. It will not take place. The chief of Aram is Damascus. The chief of Damascus is Rezin. In 65 more years, Ephraim will be shattered as a nation. The chief of Ephraim is Samaria, and the chief of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. If you do not believe this, you cannot be trusted. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as the grave or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not test the Lord. So then Isaiah said, listen, house of David, isn't it enough for you to be tiresome for people that you are also tiresome before my God? Therefore, the Lord will give you a sign. The young woman is pregnant and is about to give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. Here ends our reading. May God indeed add blessing to the reading of these words. And then lastly, I offer you the gospel passage of this week, this Sunday before Christmas, this fourth Sunday of Advent, a gospel passage I know is familiar and beloved to you and sometimes falls on Christmas Eve as one of our lessons from the first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Many, many years ago, there was a man named Abraham married to a woman named Sarah. Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerahah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron. And so the generations went, father to son, mother to daughter, and they were people, good and bad, kind and cruel, Israelite and foreigner, Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. The line continued person to person, from the king all the way down to the commoner, in the land of Israel and out to Babylon and back. And finally, Eleazar the father of Matan, and Matan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 
14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. And so it was 42 generations they waited from Abraham to Mary. They waited and passed along the promise that one day a Messiah would come, the Prince of Peace, the one who would bring light and life and hope to all the people of the world. And so it was 42 generations they waited from Abraham to Mary. They waited. This is how the birth of Jesus took place. When Mary, his mother, was engaged to Joseph before they were married, she became pregnant with the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. Because he didn't want to humiliate her, he decided to call off their engagement quietly. And as he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place so that what the Lord had spoken through the prophets would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel means which means God with us when Joseph woke up he did just as the angel from God commanded and took Mary as his wife but he didn't have relations with her until she gave birth to a son and they called him Jesus here ends our reading may God indeed add blessings to the reading of these holy words this day and always amen to join me in the spirit of prayer. Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for these December days, for the cold and chill of winter, for snow and rain, and even wind. We give you thanks for earth as it freezes and stays frozen for winter months, that it might hold the promise of spring in it. We give you thanks for waiting days when we watch the growing light and we remember and await the coming again of a Messiah in our midst. We give you thanks for sacred story and the ways it has been handed down to us generation after generation. That the meditations of my heart and the words on my lips might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, my Savior and Redeemer. I didn't always love Beethoven. I didn't always understand the complexity of Beethoven. Beethoven's ninth is as dramatic as any of Beethoven's other symphonies. Ode to Joy was not a piece that was familiar enough to me that it resonated with words in my mind when I heard it until into my adulthood. Yet more reveling of sound and the contrasting ways that it carries and evokes emotion. <clears throat> Ode to joy. This is the week for joy. It is the week for joy and perhaps as you heard our scripture passages this morning, you pondered why this week, why these readings. This indeed has been where my head has been. Why this week, why these readings? This somewhat odd passage from Isaiah and this passage of waiting that comes to us in the Gospel of Matthew, they do not ring out easy joy as some of the other scripture passages we have heard these weeks might. But it is nevertheless good news, both in the prophet Isaiah and in the Gospel of Matthew, we hear good news coming to us. In the prophet Isaiah, we hear again and again the messenger of God, the prophet Isaiah, saying to a persecuted, oppressed people in danger, do not be afraid. Be careful, stay calm, do not fear, do not lose heart. For the Lord God will take care of you and your people. Ask for a sign from God. 
the prophet says to the people. And the people, thinking it's the right answer, right, say back to the prophet, no, no, we trust in the Lord. We will not push and ask for a sign. But the prophet Isaiah says something surprising. The prophet responds and says, oh, you tiresome people. Won't you, you are also tiresome for God? Right, the prophet says, I invited you to ask for a sign and you wouldn't even ask. You wouldn't even ask for assurance that God is in and through all things. Even your hesitation and fear peeks through in wanting and waiting for the presence of the Lord. So Isaiah, the prophet of God, the mouthpiece of God, always more generous than perhaps we as tiresome people deserve, says, I will give you a sign anyway. I will, what's the, Lord, the word here? The Lord will give you a sign. A young woman is pregnant and about to give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. There is the root of this story. There is the seedling of joy on this week. We spent quite a lot of time thinking and studying joy a couple years ago. Those of you that are new to the community missed that year that we dwelled uh, richly and deeply in the spiritual practice and gift of joy. I've been thinking a lot about those conversations and studies and um, teachings as I've prepared for this week. The things that resonate still with me after that year of joy that we dwelled richly in is the constant reminder that joy is not happiness, that joy is not driven by circumstance or surface level emotion, that joy is much more complex and deeper than that. Even still, perhaps particularly still in this season, joy that is pronounced and sung in hymn and carol in a uh, shouted from rooftop is still sort of meant in that superficial passing fleeting way, that way of happiness and exuberance. But that is not the deep and rich practice of a spiritual joy. The people waited for 42 generations. The people waited for a Messiah. The people waited in joy. The people waited in joy because joy comes to us in a knowing of suffering, in a knowing of loss, in a knowing of hardship, and in a trusting that there will still be a tomorrow. There will still be a future with hope, a future where God is still present. There's an old verse, joy comes to us in the morning. I think of that and I think it's the reassurance there will always be a morning, right? We've been singing and you've been hearing the choir turn over the words of this ancient poem week after week this Advent. I believe, I believe in the sun even when the sun is not shining. I believe in the light even when I cannot see it. I believe in love even when I cannot feel it. I believe in joy even when I am sorrowful. It's that trusting, that keeping of the faith, that again the sun will rise, that again the morning will come, that the Lord indeed has sent a sign and the Messiah will come. So all the generations, they waited from Abraham to Mary until the next sign of God arrived. It comes in a dream. My dreams are often rich and vivid. We've talked too about the power of dreaming in these pandemic days. These dreams that have sometimes caught us unaware and unsettled, that have sometimes stirred us to alertness and awakeness in the night. They often carry uh, for us a sign of the holy. Beethoven's Ode to Joy, my movie recommendation for you this week. I'll put the link uh, in the email. You can watch the whole movie on YouTube for free. You can also borrow it um, over one of the streaming um, services that our library provides. I acquainted myself with the streaming service Hoopla that the Tufton Borough Free Library offers, and I was able to borrow um, this beautiful documentary following the ninth it tells the story of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. 
how he created it. Beethoven writes this piece when he is aging and quite deaf and could not hear at all. His silence was transformed into an echo through the ages and this music has been used again and again, century after century, continent after continent by a people mustering the courage, mustering the inspiration, mustering the joy to move forward. This beautiful documentary will uh, chronicle on five different continents protest marches against evil dictators that used this peace to inspire and move a people as hope in the midst of natural disaster in some cases to tap into a human level of deep joy to move a people of many faiths of all faiths out of the fearful place of anxiety and despair and into a morning. We are a people who know well the Ode to Joy. Andy and I try to program it not all that often so that you don't tire of its beautiful words and language. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. What does joy look like in your life this week? Where is it that you find lasting resonances of a sign from the holy that has come even when you were not brave enough to ask for it? Of a sign of the presence of the expected Messiah that will come even if you have waited 42 generations for its coming? Where has joy been planted? In your family? In your home? Where you have endured hardship and despair? fear and anxiety, nights of sleeplessness, and perhaps even upsetting dreams. My friends, joy has to be practiced. That's my other resonant takeaway from a couple years ago. Joy does not always come easily. Joy must be practiced like habit, like a counting of the stars at night or a morning ritual or a conscious breathing, joy must be practiced. We must take it on and name it and claim it. Reminds me of the ways we must practice our faith. It too does not come easily. We must take it up and take it as our own. Light the candles of Advent and immerse ourselves in the teachings and the scriptures to pray and be still to be in conversation, to unpack and unwrap the complex words of our texts that don't always come easily to our modern ears. Just as our faith needs to be kept and practiced, so too does joy. Joy must come to us like muscle planning, like muscle practicing and rep continuing. This is a week of joy as we walk into a Christmas that will be perhaps unlike many we've had before. It will take your good investigating, your good mindfulness, your good naming to find joy in these days. It's too easy only to name the darkness and the hardship. So as we approach these Christmas days, I commend to you Beethoven's Ninth this day and always. May it be so. Amen.
to join me in a time of prayer. In times when humanity disappoints, perhaps even when our own thoughts and behaviors disappoint, it is an important act to call out, to name and to claim the consequences of our wrongs. And in times of distress, it is a prophetic act to call out, to name and claim our belief in the promise of joy. I believe that we sometimes have been silent in the face of injustice, and I believe we are capable of raising our voices and insisting on goodness for all. I believe we have been afraid of feeling deeply and making our joy small. And I believe that deep joy of community can always be present even in hard times. I believe that sometimes we wonder if we can make a difference and I believe small acts of kindness and help do make a real difference. We believe. We believe even when we are discouraged. We believe that even when we are discouraged, raising our voices for justice will offer us joy. So let us be in a spirit of prayer as I offer this prayer for the waiting. Oh God, we are waiting for your creative spark to ignite us and transform us. We are waiting for your healing and comfort for lives taken by the coronavirus, for the damage done to our earth and the violence that has ripped through too many communities. Oh God, we wait in hope. We are waiting for your justice to sway the rich and powerful to care for the poor, the lonely, the orphaned, and the immigrant, but also know that our hearts and hands must act for change. Oh God, we wait in peace. We are waiting for the whole world to tilt away from death and destruction towards play and imagination. Oh God, we wait with love. And we are waiting for love to come again, to remind us again it does not require any talent to do your work. Oh God, we wait in joy. Help us, oh God, to paint and dance, to sing and scribble, to use our hands, to create your realm even as we wait. Amen.
justice, but we do not wait to work for change. We wait for restored health, but we do not wait to work to heal. We wait for wholeness, but we do not wait to work at binding the brokenness. We wait for peace, but we do not wait to work to eliminate hatred. And so my friends, like bells ringing out the news that God is ever present with us, fill the night left by sadness with messages of joy. Amen.